Well, good evening. Tonight, the title of the message is The Path of Life. Throughout the scriptures, when it describes believers, a lot of times it refers to our life as a believer as traveling down a path. And so um, we're going to talk about paths and, and choices tonight. And what I want to do, though, is I want to start by sharing uh, two verses that have meant a lot to me throughout my life, ones that I've kind of tried to pattern my life after, uh, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. So if we could have those up on the screen, please. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, So trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So what I want to do this evening is I want to tell you a story found in the Old Testament. One of the stories that we kind of skipped over because there's so many of them, when you try to do the, the whole Old Testament and the, the few months that we've done it, you've got to lose some, miss some stories. And so one of the stories we missed is uh, one that I've been looking forward to preach on for a while until I really began to study it. Then I found it was a little bit more difficult than I thought it was going to be. But um, the story is actually a commentary on these two verses. Uh, and so the, the first probably half, two-thirds of the story will be about the first verse, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Unfortunately, in this story, it's that second phrase where the emphasis is on. And instead of leaning not on your own understanding, it's people leaning on their own understanding and the problems that ensue when you do that. And then when we get to the end, we'll focus on the last part where it talks about in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. So the story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse, chapters 4, 5, and 6. And um, it's a story about the nation of Israel. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God laid out a very specific plan for the nation of Israel. He said, basically, if you will simply follow this plan, I will bless you, I will be with you, I will direct you, I will help you, I'll be the God to you that you need me to be. When your enemies attack, you're not going to win. I'm going to win. And so, the plan was simple. All you need to do is you need to love me and serve me. Love me and serve me, and I will take care of you. And I will lead you down the best possible path you can go. No, that path won't always be easy. It will be difficult at times. But when I allow difficulties to come in, it's because there's lessons I want you to learn. And I will take you through those difficult times. So you can choose the path of loving me and serving me. But when you really boil down the, those two thoughts, loving and serving God, what God is saying is, I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want you just to see me as some God that's out in the, the heavens that's, that's there if you need me to call upon him whenever we get in trouble. I want to have a day-to-day -day relationship with you. I want to walk through life side by side with you. He was saying that I want to do that for the entire nation of Israel, but I also want to do it for the individuals inside that nation as well. And God has the same goal for us today that we have a relationship with him where he walks side by side with us as we go through our lives. And so, we're going to take a look first of all at the Israelites. And so, instead of using uh, slides today, I'm going to use um, a little bit different visuals. And so, here we have the Israelites. Okay, so, when we come to 1 Samuel chapter 4, they're getting ready to go into a battle. They're fighting against the Philistines. The Philistines are a warrior nation. And they only had five cities and the territory around those cities, but they guarded them carefully and they were a tough enemy to face. The Israelites had been... Oh, I forgot. I didn't finish Deuteronomy 28, did I? Deuteronomy 28, God says, if you do things right and serve me, good things will happen. But if you choose to walk away from me and disobey me, then negative consequences are going to take place. 
You're not going to get the rain you need for the crops. You're going to lose in front of your enemies. I'm not going to be able to protect you like you want me to. There's going to be problems that arise. And so you have a choice. You can go down the path that is best for you, that I'll lead you, or you can choose to go your own way and follow your path. But when you choose to follow your path, you're going to wind up paying the consequences for that. And the Israelites, unfortunately, time after time after time, they chose to go down their path. They chose to turn away from the God of Israel. They would stop worshiping him. They would start worshiping the false gods that are all around them. But they kind of looked at God like a genie. That uh, when we get in trouble, God, you're going to be there to bail us out. But until we get in trouble, as long as things are going good, God, we really don't need you. You can just kind of keep your distance. And that's the attitude they had as a nation. Now, there are some individuals who are loving and serving God faithfully. But as a nation, they chose to turn away from God. And so God allowed to happen exactly what he said would happen. We come to this battle. So they're fighting the Philistines. So let's put a Philistine up here. So, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, it talks about the fact that the Israelites and the Philistines were going into battle. Now, the Israelites did something that's very easy to do. When you begin to get your focus off of God and what he wants, and you get your focus on your path, the way you want to go, it's very easy to begin to buy into the philosophy of the world around you. And the Israelites had done that. They'd begun to buy into the philosophy of the nations around them. There are two key things that they bought into that really kind of play into the story. Number one, when a nation would worship an idol, they would make a statue of that idol. It could be gold, it could be silver, it could be wood, whatever. But when they made that idol, that statue, and they set it in front of them, to them, that was their God. It was not simply a representation of their God, it was their God. When they bowed down to that statue, they were bowing down to their God, not a symbol or a picture of their God. The Israelites kind of bought into that. And the other one that they bought into was the, the nations around them believed that when there's a battle taking place on the earth between two nations, there's also a battle up in heaven. The God of the one nation was battling the God of the other nation. And whichever God up in heaven won the battle, that's who won down on the earth. And so the Israelites had that kind of a mindset. And so as they're approaching this battle, they're approaching it with confidence. Because number one, they'd know that in the past God had given victories, many victories over and over again. So they knew that God could do it. They had God on their side. Their God was more powerful, they believed. Even though they had not been obeying God, they knew that God was powerful. And so they just simply expected that God would give them the victory. And so they go out to fight the Philistines. When they go out to fight the Philistines, it says in verse 2, the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. When they joined the battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And so here are the Israelites. They're going into the battle, thinking that God is going to be giving them the victory. But instead of getting a victory, they get a defeat. 4,000 of their soldiers died that day. And so they got done after the battle was done. They came back to their camp. And, and of course, they were kind of shocked, wondering what was going on. How could this happen? And so they began to ask questions. And it's interesting, through this story, the Israelites ask a question. And then there's a couple times the Philistines ask a question. The Philistines ask far better questions than the Israelites. Because uh, the Israelites, after they got defeated, they came back to their camp. Uh, the elders of Israel said, th this kind of floors me. Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Who are they blaming? They're putting the entire blame for this whole loss upon God. They didn't say, God, why did you let the Philistines defeat us? They said, God, why did you defeat us before the Philistines? They were blaming God. 
Now, if they'd have simply gone back to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and read Deuteronomy 28, it would have been very clear why they lost the battle. But instead, the, the question they should have asked, they should have said, God, what did we do wrong that would cause you not to fight for us? That would have been the right one to ask, but they didn't. They asked the wrong question. And so they went back to their worldly way of thinking. And so they're blaming God for this, but then they get the bright idea, well, the reason why God didn't win this battle for us is because God wasn't with us. And so here's their solution. They said, um, they sent to Shiloh, but let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. They were saying, all we got to do is we got to bring the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what's the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant was basically a box covered with gold that was to be a symbol of the presence of God. It was used to represent God. It was not God. It was just a symbol to represent God and the presence of God among them. But they had bought into this worldly way of thinking. And so they said, the reason why we lost is because God isn't with us. But what does God promise in his word? I will never leave you or forsake you. That God is with us all of the time. And so, but again, because of their, their mind, their, their thinking was off, they thought, okay, now we'll just bring God to the camp. And when God is in the camp, now we're not going to lose. He's not going to let anything happen to this box. Because this is a special box. So when the Ark of the Covenant came into the camp, they started rejoicing. They started celebrating because now there was no chance they were going to lose this battle. And they were laughing and, and rejoicing and celebrating and clapping so loud, way over in the Philistine camp, they could hear it. And they heard the noise going on in the, nation, in the camp of Israel. And so they sent spies to find out what was going on. And they got the bad news back that God is in their midst because that box was there. But here's where the Philistines asked a little bit different question. The Ark of the Covenant comes in, and now they're terrified because they'd heard about this God. They'd heard the battles that uh, he had won for the nation of Israel, how he defeated the Egyptians, that kind of stuff. And so the Philistines were afraid. They said, God is coming to the camp. Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. And then this is the question they asked. Who will deliver us from the hands of these gods? You see, they understood that before this God, they were powerless. <coughs> they understood that um, this God was a powerful God, more powerful than them, that they could not win this battle by themselves. And so they were willing to humble themselves and look at what they needed to do to get this victory. And they're afraid because there's no way they could do it. But somebody among the Philistines finally um, stood up and said, uh, wait a minute. Be strong. Conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become the servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourself like men and fight. And they began to think, if we lose this battle, we're going to be slaves to the Hebrews. We don't want that to happen. So they decided to join in and fight. So again, they come back, they're, they're fighting together. And the Israelites this time are even more confident that God's going to give them the victory because... God is right there with them. And they go into battle, and guess who lost the battle? The Philistines fought, Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. Now, when it says every man fled to his tent, what it meant was the battle was a rout. I mean, they were defeated. So much so, they knew there's no way we can win this thing, and they just turned tail and ran for their lives. That's how bad the defeat was. And it goes on and it says 30,000 of the soldiers of Israel were killed in this battle. This isn't a fun story. And so, now, why would God do that? Because there's a couple other things that happen too. Because uh, the Bible says that um, Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, the, the, the priests who brought the Ark of the Covenant to there, they were killed as well. And then the Philistines actually captured the Ark of God. 
Now, if you're an Israelite, think what would be going through your mind. They've captured God. God is no longer with us. God must not have been as powerful as we thought he was. And so the Israelites were struggling. And so I'm, I'm studying this, getting ready for the message. I'm thinking to myself, God, why is this story here? This is not a fun story. I don't see a happy ending in this story. The ark gets taken. And I think one of the lessons that God wanted to teach the Israelites was, my presence doesn't depend on a box. I am with you every moment of every day. You see, what God is looking for is he's looking for a relationship. And the Israelites had turned their back on him. And instead of having that wonderful relationship they could have had with him, they were going their own way and suffering the consequences of going their own way. And so what God is doing, he's trying to show his nation, his people, it's not about a box. It's not about what you do or don't do. It's not about making sure your T's are all crossed, your I's are all dotted. What it's about is about a relationship with me. You build a relationship with me, that'll take care of all the do's and don'ts. But focus on that relationship, and they refuse to do it. And so God has given them a very real object lesson that it's not about a box, it's about a relationship. The problem is they're not listening. See, they, in their minds, they've kind of lost God. And that's a problem. But if you're a Philistine, you've got an even bigger problem. Because now you've got God on your hands. Because now they've got this box. So, in their minds, again, this is the Israelite God. So what do you do when you capture an enemy and you get their God? Well, what you do is you take it to your main temple. And so they went to the city of Ashdod. And in Ashdod, they had a temple to the god Dagon. That was their number one chief deity. Uh, this is about the best picture I could find of Dagon. He was actually half man, half fish. So the bottom part was a fish and the top part was a man. And so they had this temple with a big statue of Dagon in it. Right centrally located, they would come in there to worship you know, Dagon. And so they took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in a little spot off to the side in an inferior place, in a lesser place, to show that Dagon was the number one god and Jehovah was subservient or less than Dagon. And they go through their whole day, they worship all their service, they worship service, that kind of stuff. And they get all done today, they go home, and then they come back the next morning to again open up the, the temple and start to worship going again. But they walk in and they find Dagon is down on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, like I said, this is not just a little tiny idol that would very easily tip over. This was a huge statue that would take a lot to tip over. And yet somehow this thing had tipped over and it was bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you would think the Philistines look at that, and, but what do they do? They simply, they put it back up, and they went through their normal day as though nothing had happened. And so they, they continued the worship service and everything, and go through the day praising and worshiping Dagon and talking about how great Dagon is, how he's much better than this God of the Israelites. And they get all done, and they go home. The next day they come back in. Dagon is again down on his face before the Ark of the Covenant, but this time his hands and his head have been cut off. God's saying, I got him right where I want him, leave him there. And again, I looked at that, and I said, why is this story in the scriptures? And again, God began to open my eyes a little bit to see the amazing love and grace that God has. What was God doing in this situation? The Philistines were enemies of Israel. They had just killed over 3,400 of the Israelite soldiers in battle. God could have simply said, I'm going to wipe you out. But what does God do? He gives them a very real picture of the fact that he is greater than, ba than Dagon, their God. That he is a true and living God. That Dagon is the one that is subservient to the true and living God. And so what he's doing by this is he's saying to the, the people, 
Dagon's not your God. I am. And he was giving them the opportunity to turn from their sin, to turn from Dagon, and to start following and serving the true and the living God. That's grace. That's mercy. That's an amazing love that God has, that he would give them that opportunity to show them his power in a way that was very clear, a way that they could understand in a very clear way and see how great he is and give them the opportunity to turn to him. And if they'd have turned to him, God would have accepted them because he wanted a relationship with them just as much as he wanted a relationship with the Israelites. And this is where I don't like the story because they didn't listen either. And so because they didn't listen, they kept following their own way. The only major change they made was um, the spot where the Ark of the Covenant was. They no longer walked over that. So they, they realized something was special about that or whatever, so they just stayed away from that area. But that was about it. And so God sent a plague among the people of Ashdod. They began to die. And they begin to realize, well, the reason why this plague is hitting, it has to do with this ark. So we need to get rid of it. So like I said, there are five cities of the um, Philistines, so they sent it down to Gath. The people of Gath got the ark. And what do you think happened to the people of Gath? They began to get sick. The plague began to hit them. Thousands of people began to die. We don't want to die, so let's send it to Ekron. They got ready to send it to Ekron. The people of Ekron said, wait a minute. We don't want that thing. We don't want to die. And then they asked another question that was so key and so vital. The question they asked was, what shall we do with the ark of God? They understood that they had offended this God. They understood how powerful this God was. And they understood that they needed to do something to show this God that they understood they'd sinned against him and to find some way to get him to stop the punishment that was coming upon them. And so they asked the right question. But again, they used their own worldly philosophy to try to come up with an answer. Instead of truly turning to this God and saying, we get it, they said, we've got to appease this God so he no longer hurts us. And so they got together and they talked about it and uh, one of their priests or whatever came up with the idea, well, we've got to send the, the Ark of the Covenant back to the Israel, but we can't send it empty-handed. We've got to send an offering with it, a trespass offering, to show this God that we know we've messed up and ask for his forgiveness for this. But there's still a little bit of doubt there. So they decided, we can't just um, take it back to them. So what we're going to do is, you need to make a new cart. One that's never been used, and then you need to find two milk cows. Cows that have never been yoked together. And then what you need to do is yoke those cows together, hook them up to that cart, put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart, and then put um, the trespass offering. Well, what are we going to get for a trespass offering? So they picked something that dealt with the disease that was kind of spreading through them. So they picked five golden rats, one for each of the main cities, and five golden tumors. I have no idea what a golden tumor would look like. It's, I, I, I can't even begin to think about it, but somehow they were able to fashion something that looked like a golden tumor. And so they put these in the cart, and then they watched it. And they sent a couple spies to see what would happen. They said, if the cart goes right to Beth Shemesh, then the God of Israel is the one that's behind all of this. If it doesn't move anywhere, just stays there or the cows don't go anywhere special then it means that it's just all coincidence and they let them go and what do you think the cows did they made a beeline for Beth Shemesh but they were mooing on the way because they had calves back that needed to be fed but yet they obeyed God and did what God asked them to do and they went straight to Beth Shemesh and they got to Beth Shemesh and as I got there, I noticed something interesting as I was studying it this week. When the Ark of the Covenant came, it was harvest time, and they were busy harvesting their field. And so when the Ark of the Covenant came, they were excited. But then it hit me. 
It says earlier on that they were seven months without the Ark of the of Covenant. Seven months the Ark of the Covenant was over here in Philistine territory. Seven months they were without their God. But what were they doing? The exact same thing they'd always done. Nothing changed. They were going through their normal day-to-day -day routines. There's no hint of them calling out, trying to find out how are we going to get God back in. There's no hint that they were distraught over the fact that God wasn't with them. They were just simply going through their day-to-day -day routines as though nothing had happened. And to be perfectly honest, they had been living their life apart from God anyway, so it was no big deal that God was no longer there with them. And so they, they're excited, of course, because the Ark of the Covenant is back, and they take the two cows and they offer them for sacrifice. And I wish the story stopped there, but it doesn't. Because it goes on, and it says, and we see the, um, the mindset of the, the children of Israel, how they had lost respect and honor for God, because this was a special box that was to be placed in the holy of holy places where only a few people would be able to even see this thing, and see the experience, because the presence of God was settled over this box. It was special, it was sacred. And yet the people around that area um, where the ark went to, they began to look into the ark, they began to touch it, and there were many people that died because of the disrespect they showed for the Ark of the Covenant. And I look at that. I say, God, why is this story here? I like stories with happy endings. This is not a happy ending. The Philistines, they had a chance to embrace you. They rejected it. The Israelites had a chance to see you do something amazing. And to see that it's not just about a box, but it's about a relationship with you, and they still rejected it. Even when people were dying all around them, they still held to their way instead of going your way. Why is the story here? And the only real answer that I have for that is, this story shows the amazing love of God. The reckless love of God that we just sang about. The fact that even though God, God's own people were rejecting him, and he could have just wiped them out, he came back to them and gave them another opportunity, another illustration to show, I want that relationship with you. And they rejected him. The Philistines, he gave them the same opportunity to have a relationship with him, and they rejected him. But yet God kept going back. He kept pursuing. Even when people reject He's still going after them. And that just shows me what an amazing God that we serve. The love that he has. The Old Testament, it seems like so many times people think it's just a book about God being a mean, big judge and a meanie and, and allowing all these people to die and everything. But when you look at those stories, you see God, his grace, his love, calling people to a relationship with him, and they refuse time after time after time. And he doesn't give up. And he continues today to pursue relationships with people, with individuals. Even though, again, time after time after time, people will reject him, he still is there pursuing. It's an amazing God that we serve. And so, as I was thinking about this, and thinking about how am I going to kind of wrap this up and, and give an application, again, these two verses came. Because then it says, lean not in your understanding. The Israelites, the Philistines, were leaning on their own understanding. And because they leaned on their own understanding, they walked away from God. They suffered consequences. What does God say? Instead of leaning on our own understanding, we need to trust in him. But let's look at the second part of that. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. That's quite a picture to me. And the way God has pictured it to me is, uh, is like this. I do a lot of walking. I'm trying to lose weight, so I, I'm trying to get a, a good number of steps in every day. And so I do a lot of walking. When I'm walking by myself, I go at my own pace. I go wherever I want to go. I, I can go fast. I can go slow. I can sit down if I want. While I'm walking, I might be listening to some music. I might be listening to a message or, or maybe praying or um, just even letting my mind wander, not thinking about much of anything. And that's fine because I'm walking alone. It's, it's, it's about me. 
and my getting the exercise. Doesn't matter what I do really as long as I get the steps in that I need to get in. But I also do a lot of walking with my wife. When she's walking beside me, most of the time we're side by side. Sometimes we've got to do single file, but most of the time it's side by side. Just having her right by my side alters the way I walk. Because it's no longer just about me, it's about us together. And so as we're walking, if she walks faster, I'll walk faster. If she walks a little bit slower, I'll slow down. If she stops because she's got a stone or sneaker or something, I'll stop and wait for her to get it out of her sneaker. Sometimes while we're talking, while we're walking, we're just chatting back and forth. But I'm not a real big talker, so there's a lot of times where we're walking in silence. I'm thinking about what I'm thinking about, she's thinking about what she's thinking about. But I still understand and see that she's right there beside me. And so as I'm walking, even if I'm thinking about something totally different, I still know she's right there. And I keep in pace with her. And we're walking together. Even though we may not be talking or communicating, we're still together walking down this path. And that's the picture I see that God wants with us. That as we're walking down our path of life, He wants to walk right side by side with us. Because He knows if He's walking right beside us, it is going to alter in some ways the way that we live our lives. It's going to alter them for the good. But then I began to think about it. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to build a relationship with God when we get so busy in our lives that we never stop to take time to think about Him. We never even take time to really acknowledge that He's there. If you're like me, there's been many times where you get up in the morning and you've got so much on your plate, you just get busy and you go through the entire day and you don't think about God even one time. Can you develop a relationship with God when that's the, the attitude of your life? It doesn't work. So that's where that phrase, in all your ways acknowledge Him, comes into play. And what God has really been speaking to me lately about the fact is acknowledge is not something that's hard. It just simply means to understand that He is there. So it's not like you have to pray a 20-minute prayer or read you know, 50 scriptures or whatever. It's simply a matter of saying, God, thank you that you're right here with me right now. Guide me as I walk. Help me make right decisions. That's all it takes to acknowledge that God is there. And so I began to think, what would happen if, if I began or if we began to acknowledge God more often in our days? And so let's say you get up in the morning. And first thing in the morning, you acknowledge God and just say simply, God, thank you for this new day you've given me. Thank you for the opportunity to walk with you. Remind me that you're walking with me throughout the day. And then get busy. That might be the only time in the day. And so you, you get done at the end of the day, you look back, there's at least one time when you acknowledge God. What if you say, that's not enough? I can't develop a relationship acknowledging Him one time. So here's what I'm going to do. Every meal, I'm going to acknowledge God. So when I eat my breakfast, before I eat my breakfast, I'm simply going to say, God, thank you that you're here with me. Thank you that your presence is right here, right now. Guide me through this day, please. You do the same thing at lunchtime. Do the same thing at supper time. And then when you end the day, you again acknowledge God. Just a simple God, thank you for being with me today. I really appreciate it. You look at it now, what do we have? We've got one, two, three, four five specific times through the day that you've acknowledged God. That's a whole lot better than zero. But you see, we have to be intentional about this. It's not going to happen just by accident or just because we feel like we should. We have to specifically say, I'm going to acknowledge God at breakfast, at lunch, and at supper. And you start doing that for a little bit and it's working. And so then what if you say, well, how about if mid-morning I acknowledge God. And maybe mid-afternoon, when I get in that afternoon slump and I get really tired or whatever, God, thank you that you're here with me. And then maybe in the evening. And all of a sudden you see the times throughout the day that you're acknowledging that God is there is growing. And the Bible tells us in the book of James that if you draw near to God, you know what God's going to do? God's going to draw near to you. And so, when you take these steps, what you're showing to God is you're showing God, God, I want to draw near to you. I want to do more than just see you as a genie up there to answer my prayers. I want to have that relationship with you so you're walking with me step by step by step. 
and God begins to draw closer to you. And when you do that consistently, you know what you're going to find? God's going to begin to open his eyes, open your eyes to see where he's at work. So many times when we pray, we ask God to be with us. But yet God has already promised he's with us. Instead of asking God to be with us, we need to pray, God, open my eyes to see that you are with me right here, right now, when I need you. And God will begin to open up your eyes to see him doing more and more in your life. And when you see God more active in your life, you're going to want to build that relationship more and more with him. He's going to help you to draw closer to him. And as you live your life, as you're walking step by step with God, what does he say? He will direct your paths. He'll lead you the path of the best life you can possibly have. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the story that you put in the scripture that even though it's hard to understand and it's not much fun because it doesn't have a happy ending, you can still teach us through it. God, help us to learn to acknowledge you, to make that commitment to say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to acknowledge you throughout the day and set specific times and reminders that we'll do that. And God, we'll see what you do. We'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.